And this is what I chat with Abraham, the founder of Tepia. Now, if you're anything like me, you like developing apps. Some of you want to develop apps for many other companies. That's what Tepia does. They do mobile apps. That's their main thing, but they can do the whole stack as far as I understand. Now, if you're like me, you want to dive into apps and just build them. You hear what the problem is. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go solve it. Now, Abraham and his team actually do this a little bit differently. They do it a lot more deliberately, and it's really interesting on their approach on how they actually execute building out these projects and his advice for that. Now, of course, I talked to Abraham about all sorts of things. We start with where he started back in the early days of the web and what's brought him to today. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's always nice talking to founders that know how to code, but that have also built up these businesses. So I hope you enjoy it and look forward to seeing you next time. I was looking at your LinkedIn as one does, and I'm really curious about, you said you started your first internet product at 16. This is like your opening line, I love that. What was that product, and how did that bring you down the rabbit hole that you're at now? Gosh, it's a little bit embarrassing bringing that up, but as a 16 year old, this was, the, what would it be, two, like right around the year 2000, nice. and you know, uh, the internet is not the same as it is today, and I be at that time that that time period like e-commerce was barely a thing if I if I remember correctly. Um, so I was in like uh, super enthusiastic about everything that's oh, that was happening on the internet. I saw it as like this amazing opportunity, and I was in love and connected from day one. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of delaying what the what the the website and product was, but I was really into the WWE, WWF at the time. Hulk Hogan. And so, yeah, and like at that time period, it was more like Steve Austin, Uncle Steve Austin and Undertaker. Okay. Um, but I was really into the community, um, almost like an insider of some sorts. And so I had a blog. Um, it was nothing too crazy. It wasn't like a pro, like a crazy, you know, product as we can imagine today. But it was a, it was something that was live, active. People were interacting with it and uh, had a lot of fun with it for some time. That's awesome. I, I mean, those early. I wonder where it'd be today if you stuck with it. It sounds like you didn't, because like, <laughs> no. wrestling it, it it blew up, right? The Rock. I remember a video game yeah. when The Rock was like, this was probably not too. It was probably around that time. And it was, can you smell what the rock's cooking? That's what made him famous, I feel like. And there was there was a Nintendo 64 game where he's like going nuts. Was it around that time? Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yeah, and, and at, that, uh, at that age, I remember when he first got in, he was a, a heel, like a, a bad guy. And uh, that was when he was the best, though. Like when when he became like a superhero, like a celebrity, not the same, but... When he when he was a when he was when he was a heel in the in WWE, uh, he was one of the best, like one of my favorites. That's that's great. I, I wonder if he'll ever go back to that. Probably not. Now his 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 I personal know, brand yeah. is too too much. Um, so you you built this blog. Was it? Did you use Dreamweaver or how did you how did you create it? It was pure HTML. Oh, gotcha. And I don't think CSS existed at the time. Yeah. yeah so a lot of manual HTML. Yeah. It was it was. It was, it was a drag, but you at that young age, you just do what you got to do. Yeah, inline styles or something. I, I don't I, I don't remember at all. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I think lists. What was it? Oh, uh, just the fact that it was a list using lists. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. I think my first website was I want to say it was probably two thousand and two, maybe something like that. I got a, I got a book on Dreamweaver, and just got hooked. Yeah. It, like it was still HTML and CSS, but Dreamweaver did a lot of the work for yeah. you. I don't even think that product's yeah. around anymore. Um, but but it didn't yeah. hook me as I use I use Dream. Yeah, you used it. I used Dreamweaver too at the time. Did you? I'm familiar with Dreamweaver. Yeah. Yep. It, it, did making that website is that what hooked you into technology, or was it something else? Yeah, and and it was just a community that I was part of. Uh, I grew up on internet forums, yeah. and it was strange. I. As a, as a teenager, um, I was more like I was into the idea of impressing all like my internet friends. So I just I continuously wanted to push the envelope, do things, build things to impress them. And so yeah, that, uh, just looking for things to do. Yeah, 
constantly iterating? Were were like family friends asking you to build websites at that time, or? Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> I do. Yeah, because like I think. Um, Oh man, that was right around the first bubble that popped, right? So, like, most people didn't even know what the internet really was or what you could do with it. Um, but then, of course, it started to explode so shortly after that. Did you do Adobe Flash too? Did you learn all of that? Um, a little bit, yeah. I, and what was the anim animation software that they had? Was it Flash? Ma uh, I think there was like one other. I know they had Macromedia Flash. I'm, I'm trying to remember what yeah. before it was Adobe. I, I don't. I don't. But I think they had a few other tools for uh, animation too. But no worries. Yeah, I, I remember doing like a, trying to do a stick figure animation. You remember how those became popular at one point? Yeah. Doing like, like the stick figures uh, fighting yes. uh, one another. There was a few uh, animations like that on the internet at the time. Yeah, I, I tried my hand at it. It was really bad. <laughs> but yeah, it was like one one short scene. <laughs> yeah. So so you built this website and then. Fast forward a few years, were you starting to program? Like, when did you start getting into writing software? Um, there was a gap, so um, I kind of, I kind of stopped working on products on the internet. Um, I was in school, uh, didn't do anything. But at one point, um, I did create another community. Um, I, I I still wasn't programming anything yet. Uh, I did create a community. It was kind of like a really local like art creative type community um that's when i started dabbling in dreamweaver too um and then i started dabbling in uh php at the time mm -hmm. so um looking at different tools so i, I kind of came from the website side uh, so um starting to look at i think wordpress at the time i can't recall uh, uh so dreamweaver wordpress and then uh, got into javascript stuff and then um I was trying to create like a video gallery type application um, at that same time. So I had a few different projects and got really heavily invested in, uh, in JavaScript, trying to uh, create this really um, interactive video gallery tool. Um, I didn't really have a product in mind building it. It was just more an exercise, but that's what I was working on. I was, at that time period, I was also, I had started my uh, a college career. Uh, unfortunately, I, I started I was a, a math major at the time, and so I was, I was always like um, choosing to like do these like internet projects rather than doing my schoolwork. I was in a weird state. It was it was a tough period in my life. I didn't have too much of the right guidance at the time, so um, I I was I was struggling with school, but then working on uh, different projects, and you know, there's a, a period there that. I'm gonna like not share today, Justin. Okay. Oh, we could talk about it offline, sure. but maybe in like in another video, I'll I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, but um, so yeah, it was a mixture of all of that, and then um, even learning kind of a little bit of like what internet marketing looks like too. So I was I was really trying to launch a product, and so I, my mindset was split between marketing and and putting yourself out there and then building the tech behind it. Um, but I, uh, to like in my career, I never really dealt super deep on one side of the equation. So I was kind of hovering in the middle of in it. In both worlds, got it. Yeah, I understand that. So so going back to the WWE thing then, I, didn't, I don't know why I didn't ask you this, but did you end up selling it? Did you end up making any money from it or was it pure oh, just fun? No, Yeah. just for yeah. fun. Yeah, it had built up, it had some sort of following and then Again, like as I was getting older, getting involved in other stuff, uh, just kind of let it peer off and die. Yeah, gotcha, as, as those projects do. Thank you, Akamai, for sponsoring this podcast. Now, we've been collaborating with Akamai Connect Cloud for many years, and as you may know, we've been able to bring some of the latest education in cutting-edge application development and deployment. Connected Cloud provides virtual machines, object storage, firewalls, marketplace with one-click apps, managed Kubernetes, and much more. Join today and start building at Leno.com slash Justin. So then with the marketing stuff, you moved into the marketing world a little bit more or? Yeah, um, at the time I was getting involved in like understanding uh, search engine optimization, um, playing around with a lot of WordPress blogs. I guess the blogging world got my attention. 
uh, there was like a subset of the internet where it was all about building like a successful blog and getting a lot of traffic on it um, and um, potentially running like get, generating ad revenue from it. Um, I didn't get too far in that space. You know, I had this background, um, but never where it became like this career or. Um, I, I can't ever say that I mastered it, but I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, gotcha. It's funny because a lot of those same conversations are still happening about around blogging, getting ad revenue, all that. It's still it is. Right? It's, it's, it's re- and um, social media, like the whole influencer space, I feel like is very similar to that time period where you're trying to build this audience, this reputation. You're just not doing it in a form of a blog. You're doing it in a form of a social media channel or totally. a profile it, it's brand. now it's now many different things right so it, it it's the blogging still i think there are still people that just absolutely crush it with blogging yeah. um, just blogging yeah. but you know the video and audio stuff has has blown up a lot um so yeah i mean i i guess like tell me about your work now tell me about tepia i'm, I'm really curious about this and yeah. the genesis of why you started this business yeah. um you know what so um, I, I can make the connection to it too. So when I, um, I, cause I further developed my programming chops after, uh, after a, a certain time, like uh, after college, where I started working full time. Uh, it was my first full time job, first salaried position for a small business. Um, and I was kind of their webmaster. So because I had the both sides of the, uh, equation uh, experience in, the, in those in, in those things. I was able to handle a lot of their marketing, SEO, Google AdWords, and then also uh, managing their not only their website, but they had a custom CRM at the time. And so, and it was written in PHP, nice. and I was very comfortable in PHP. So I started uh, uh, working on that, working on the marketing side of things. And the CEO of that company really took me under his wings, uh, and that's a big pivotal moment uh, for me because. Um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had like the self-confidence to start my own business in a similar space. So um, working on that custom CRM, uh, it expanded. It became a, like an inventory management system, custom CRM. Um, it became, a lo- there was like a whole logistics mo- module to it. Um, there was an HR component to it. Like, imagine like warehouse staff were clocking in and clocking yeah. out from that software. We even were like generating guest badges from the software. And so I was, uh, I, at that point I found out like I was the bottleneck for like the CEO's vision. And so he kind of empowered me to build a team. And, and in that case, I started figuring out how to hire different engineers, build them on a team. Uh, but it's not the, you know, it's not the, the typical corporate like uh, space like uh, the hiring engineers. We I was on a shoestring budget, so I had to learn how to um, uh, how to hire global talent yeah. a long time ago. So this was back like in two thousand, maybe um, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and um, at the time I think the it was I forget which website was the best one. There was no Upwork at the time. There was no. Um, free, it was before Freelancer too. There was like another website that we were using. Oh, but okay. Yeah, I started learning how to manage development. Was it like okay? Um, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm going blank on the time. The timeline was a right around the four hour work week and um, when that came out, <laughs> and also the world is flat. Yeah. I think that book went, also discussed some of these outsourcing tools. Anyways, keep going. Tell me more. Yeah, and it was beautiful. I, I built relationships with a lot of these engineers, and we were. I was. I was essentially kind of the product lead at that point. I was documenting, whiteboarding, writing requirements, documentation, and um, empowering my team. And we had three or four different engineers working on it. Um, and then this this software became huge. It was at two different locations. Um, uh, Cloud infrastructure. No, actually, we were storing a lot of that data locally at the time. We weren't really in the cloud yeah. yet, which was kind of uh, sad. We had um, we had some components that were in the cloud, some components that were local. Um, and then my boss again loved me so much. He he empowered me and empowered me. At one point, like I was training the warehouse staff. We we even like we were um, if you can imagine we were printing like uh, barcodes to to slap on products yeah. and. Uh, we had these like uh, portable stations that we would jerry rig together, and we had the scanning guns. And I, I had to teach warehouse staff how to use this software. Really great experience because I, I saw the the business challenges, the user interface challenges. I saw it, like front uh, first uh, like fr- 
firsthand like what all those like obstacles would look like. And so before you were before um, you were outsourcing it, were you the one developing all the code for it, or did did someone else on the team also help with yeah. it? It was all you. No, no, I was doing it. Wow. Yep, it was all me. So so when you were training people, you must have got a lot of great insights as to the challenges that they're facing with the software, so then you can make those improvements. Is that was that a big part of your job? Big time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's where I, I kind of started valuing the idea of uh, writing pristine requirements. Sure. Um, especially when you're working with global talent, you know, English isn't their first language too. You have to be very clear and precise with your language. And so that's something that actually we've taken to consideration heart here at Tepia. Like we value project management almost above, like, this is kind of counterintuitive, but above some of like the engineering quality, we like, if there's like, you know, a priority list, like PM work, I still value, like, I guess that's my bias, because yeah. that's where I ended up really focused on, but I do value the, the, the work that our PMs do, and I think that's the most important part of like managing these projects. Yeah, so if you were trying, like if you were giving yourself younger, your younger self advice, let's say you didn't have mm -hmm. that same boss, that really gave you this mm -hmm. ability to work as a PM, essentially. How, how, like, what would mm -hmm. you say? How, how would how would somebody start attempt to get some of that experience under their belt? Mm. That's yeah, that's tricky because it's. Um, you, that's yeah, that's that's kind, of, that's kind of difficult because I had this like I had. I had this like these business requirements that I was translating, yep. so that's really essential yep. uh, for PM work. So if you're on your own, what business requirements are you translating? Um, you could maybe have a vision in your own head. Um, you know, the hard part of that is putting it on paper. Okay, so yeah, this is what I would say: take your vision, put it on paper, or when I say paper, it could be you know a, a Figma, um, a, a Figma project, and then. Um, and design like as uh, don't design it like as a designer would, but like wireframe out um, your entire vision um, to the best of your ability, and then show it to people. <laughs> show it to people and see if they could understand it. That'd be and then and then work off of their feedback and then iterate on that over and over again uh, until an average layperson could understand what they're looking at. Mm. And and when you say like wireframe, do you mean like just kind of blocky, just simple designs, not super detailed, but communicates essentially what the project is trying to do? Yeah, that's the key, the communication part. So I used to tell my team, oh gosh, this is kind of embarrassing, but I'm like, I don't care how you wireframe things. It could be on paper and you could take like pictures of it. It could be on a whiteboard. It could be on a PowerPoint. It could, this is before Figma existed. So yeah. uh, it could be on um, a Word doc. Because I, I almost I use all these all these um, mediums to, 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 to write some uh, requirements and then to put wireframes together. Uh, use whatever you can, and then the key is that it's communicable. So either it's symbols or words or arrows. As long as someone else could grab it and then understand what you're trying to communicate, uh, that's that's the most important part. What? So the the someone else is it like? Because I've got a six-year-old daughter, I could probably do this with her, and yeah. she would understand certain <laughs> things. You know, is that the the yeah. level you're trying to go for, or maybe someone that's like twenty? You know what yeah. I mean? Like how how advanced? I, you that's, no, that's you're. I'm glad you said that because I, I was going to say that, but I, I didn't want it to sound uh, demeaning. But when you know, I was talking about like working with like global talent. Yeah. You want it to be like. You know, on Reddit, there's a subreddit called like "Explain It" like a, to a five-year-old. Yes. Like yes. it has to be at that yes. level. It has to be at that level. I mean, that that makes sense. Not because you're like making a judgment about them, because the quality of their work is probably no. going to be fantastic. It makes sense because your communication. I, I'm more speaking myself. My own communication. Like sometimes I have to repeat something multiple times before I'm like, oh yeah, I'm clear as to what I'm trying to say. And if you don't. If you're not clear, then there's a lot of assumptions that go in, and then that's when you waste time and yeah. money and effort, and then everyone's mm -hmm. starting starting to get frustrating, frustrated. So it, it makes sense to like yeah. kind of make it as simple as it possibly can be, but not simpler, but but enough to be able and, to do the work. Uh, uh, and with your blocky wireframes, uh, you do also need some 
uh, written uh, instructions to go along with it because there are parts of your platform or your whatever you're building that um, isn't communicable by just user interface. So you have to like talk about like error responses. You got to talk about um, automated emails coming in and out of the system. You can't you can't visualize right. that. So you do need to um, have some th supporting documents that go along with it. Uh, and then also like animations on click events, you kind of have to like describe some of that. So, so basically, if you've never written a line of code before, you could take this wireframe approach and build out a whole on software product, just not write any of the code. Is that, is that kind of how you think about things before you even write any code or are you doing it together? Uh, yeah, no, so like, um, as, as far as like uh, what we do now with Tepia when we're building out these products, yeah, we, we actually, we don't include our developers in that process. Mm -hmm. We don't include our engineers. Some of our, pro like our project managers have computer science backgrounds uh, or like they have computer science degrees. Um, but yeah, it's like, you don't need to be able to write code to do this part of the, uh, of the business. Yeah, so I guess I'm thinking in terms of like, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't know how to code, is this is yeah. this the step you would say like hey start here build out this wireframe and and make make sure it's really clear in your mind as to to the goal with this and then you can start hiring engineers or bringing engineers into the conversation yeah yeah and um and like it's kind of and it's a lot to a lot of pressure to put on someone but if you have the time mm -hmm. Uh, the time resource, I would say yes, do that. Like if you're gonna invest, like invest in that because it's gonna force you to think through your entire product, you know, every step of the way. Like we, we talk, when we talk about it, it's like make sure that there's no like dead ends where you get stuck yep. like in your app, like if you're clicking through and then make sure like every, every button is like accounted for, like how do you get to where you wanna get to, all the data is accounted for. Um, but that's if you have like the time and energy to sit down and do this. And some, sometimes our clients don't have that and it's up to us to pull it out of their brain and we do it for gotcha, them. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's a big part of the value you provide is to, to make these workflows and, and, and just yeah. solve a lot of the problems. Because I, I noticed you do a lot of mobile development. Is that primarily what you do? Do you do web apps too? Or is it is it the, yeah. the server side too? or? Mm -hmm. The server side too. We, uh, I like to just imagine us as a custom software development company. Mm -hmm. Mobile is our kind of uh, niche, our what we specialize right. in. But almost all of our mobile apps require some sort of backend, some like administrative portals too. And then our, for me, the funnest part of like what we build is actually on the business side, like the business intelligence side of the uh, of the equation where. We're an analyzing, creating KPIs and dashboards for the entrepreneur or business owner so that they can see the success of their mm. app. A lot of people don't think about that. Gotcha. And, and is that something you spend a lot of time on is like the reporting, the analytics? I think so, yeah. I think that's key um, because there's no, like you can't just throw Google Analytics on, on, onto this. Uh, some of the analytics software out there is still raw, it's still new. It's not as robust as Google Analytics, and so you can you have to be intentional. You have to design your app around the concepts of analytics, and so you have to know what to pay attention to and care about and track. Yeah, and so do you work with manufacturing companies now too? Like kind of going back to your original job and and doing a lot of that like on the line stuff. Yeah, like uh huh, I, and it's kind of um, rare, but I'll give you the best use case. So for the whole world of mobile app development, there's a subset of work that we do where it's for businesses, for industry, and where they have field agents. So if you have field agents, people out, not sitting behind a desk, the mobile app becomes really essential to communicate back home. And so we have a, like two or three clients um, in this space, so we're creating that field agent app for them. So they're out there, they're, you know, so like back in the day you'd fill out a form, take that form back home, but now, yeah, it, it could be a tablet or an app and you fill in all that information and a headquarters is getting uh, up-to-date information about their like business processes. Got it, got it, that makes sense. And, and in that case, because you had hands-on, I'm just trying to connect the dots here, you had hands-on experience when you were learning how to do all these things and as far as managing the products and making them better or projects, um, do you have your PMs go out with these field agents 
uh, or mm. like are, are they working in a different way? Yeah, that's a tough one too. I wish they could because that was an invaluable experience. Yeah. At this current time, you know, we're, we're all remote. Yeah. We're so far away gotcha. from each other. So we're like kind of figuring it out. I wish it wasn't the case. That's the one part of my business where, you know, because we're fully remote, it kind of does not hurt in the end because I learned so much information. Just being there right next to people and watching. I would have to sit there and take yeah. notes, not communicate, see them stumble, see them, you know, fumble over things. And I'm like, oh, okay, I see. I got to do this. I got to do that. I'll take a ton of notes then take that home and, and work on those right right yeah that makes sense did you are you a fan of IDEO the design agency uh, you, you, I'm not familiar you mentioned I see at Tepio we believe in human centered design IDEO I think is one of those companies uh, that helped popularize the term I believe so I'm not I'm not positive about that of, of human centered design yeah. they don't they don't do software development I don't believe. I think they do product development. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may have changed over the years, uh, but but yeah. tell me about human centered design and how you, like how that became a philosophy of yours. Yeah. So it, it, again, it happened firsthand. So seeing people using software, it's so clunky. It was so frustrating. Um, to there's a tension. There's a natural tension between us humans and then the tools that we're using, and we want it to be designed in a way where it's an extension of them and, and not something where they're, they're they're hurting. So, I'm sure. Well, I shouldn't assume this, but you know, I've, I've, I I would research a ton of UI UX. Um, I've uh, read a handful of books from way back when, and one of them, will be my favorite, is a design of everyday uh, everyday. The design of everyday objects. Objects was that the name of that book? Can I Google it real yeah, fast? Yeah, go ahead. Design. I think I think it might have been. Uh, everyday things. Everyday the things. Design That's of everyday it. things. Yeah, and who's the author again? Really good book. And so I'm pretty sure I pulled all this like from there. I can't I can't recall gotcha, exactly yeah. at this time, but. That's been really important to us at Tepia. Uh, I could expand on that. Yeah, please. Was so um. Oh, go ahead. Do you remember the author's name on, on the di design of everything? Yeah, everything I have it in front of me. It's uh, Don Norman. Don Norman, okay, yeah. Yeah, please expand on that. That would be great. Well, um, I can't tell you much about that book at this time. It's been so long since I read it. But the philosophies that I've taken from it, like why we care about the human-centered design, is because of of exactly what I was explaining earlier, just seeing people fumble with software. But that's one aspect of it. One thing too, um, I've I've kind of sensed over the years is that technologists still have a bit of an ego to them, and so when we when technologists or engineers build products, a lot of times the user has to still adapt to the product. Um, you know. One example is, I think, when Snapchat first came into existence, it was one of the strangest user interfaces. I don't know if you recall mm -hmm. having that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, you pull up Snapchat and you go, your intuition isn't just to like, what, like, what is going on here? You have to like swipe to the right, swipe to the left, and you're jumping from different screens and there was very little intuition built into that. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I think is the, the the best, the person who was the best at this was like Steve Jobs, where he understood that you know a lot of those products have to be really um, has to blend into like human um, existence. Like it, it can't just you can't have these moments of like stumbling or or obstacles or where your brain kind of disconnects and fumbles with it. So, anyways, long story short, um, it's this combination of. Let's not be egotistical. Let's not say like, ah, let's like bend, like let, the user has to bend to our will when we build these products. Like, oh, they're just, maybe they're, they're dumb or old. They don't know how to use it. Um, I'm of the mindset, no, like we really do need to nurture these tools, not make them esoteric, not make them like um, cool to be weird, but uh, make it so that when the end user is experiencing it, they're not even feeling like they're using technology. They're not even feeling like they're using a tool um, that, like, you know, 
it, it should flow like from their brain to their fingers to the software without as if it's like the one whole being um, uh, using it. So you kind of get lost in that experience and it becomes an extension of yourself. That's, um, I think that's like ideal technology, ideal software, um, especially in the business world. I think that's kind of like my mindset too, especially in the business world. Um, yeah, technology should serve people. Like that's what I keep, that's like a really core tenet of ours. It needs to serve people so that that ego thing where the user adapts to technology, I think it's a horrible thing. Like technology is built to serve humans no matter what. That's like, that's that's really core to like my beliefs. Yeah, there's something in, in uh, the email marketing space or maybe just online marketing of the confused mind doesn't buy. Um, and so uh. like it, it totally makes sense that confused mind in software isn't going to buy into the idea of continuing to use that software or in the case of employees they'll be kind of forced to have to use it but they won't love it and therefore maybe won't be as productive with it and and cost the company tons of money so that that makes a lot of sense i think i think snapchat's design to me it felt like this was specifically designed to not allow certain people to use it right they made it yeah. purposely confusing so that you were in the cool group or whatever that you wanted to call it to, to, to yeah. actually use it you know I, I was I was definitely not in the cool group I never got used to using snapchat it was never one of my things um, but since I think they've they've improved it a lot so so along those lines are you are you doing um, the equivalent term of watching somebody in person on your apps like you have like rigorous testing once it's once it's out do you use these mm -hmm. I, I don't know the name of the services but basically you hire people that have never used your software before to just run through and you get a full-on video recording and you see where they get tripped up or are you more on the other side where you're waiting to hear from uh, tickets or, or your customers like responding yeah. back yeah at this point in our business we're still in, in the in the latter yeah. where we are uh, more responsive yeah. um, only because it's just the size of the projects sure. that we're working on. Yeah. If we ever had the opportunity to build larger uh, software with uh, larger investments behind it, I would love to do some of that research, the UI, UX research. It's the best. And, and it's so, um, I forget which book I read it from too. Uh, there was another book that really made an impact on me, but they would talk about taking your software to like a local Starbucks mm -hmm. And sitting at a table, buying like a hundred dollars worth of like five dollar gift cards, and have people sit down with you and use an app right there. So you you don't necessarily even need to use um, software like the one you were suggesting. You can just do it like at your own home. Oh, that's your own neighborhood. that is a great idea. Very good, because you could you could just sit there and put a sign up saying, "Hey, I'll give you a five dollar gift card, or I'll buy you coffee yeah. to just use my app for five minutes." Essentially. Yeah, yeah, that's really yeah. cool. Um, this guy Jesse Itzler, he wrote, he created a um, basically like an Uber for private planes back in the '90s before sites and stuff. Anyways, one of the things he did was when the TED conferences were taking off, he went to Monterey to the TED conference. He didn't have a ticket or anything, but he wanted to get in front of people. And so what he did was he bought all of the muffins, I think, or or like like bagels or something like that at the local coffee shop. All the food, essentially, he bought it all and basically was giving it out to people and that's how he got his first customer. It's like that the story you just said about doing the user user uh, feedback just reminded me of that and it's like a fairly effective way to get to get people's attention is right right at right at coffee. <laughs> so so yeah. Um for sure. Sp I mean speaking of coffee, you 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 must have a favorite coffee then. Um I I I used to joke around that like I'm the opposite of like that hipster coffee like snob. Um, I I don't like I, I love coffee, yeah. but I love it for the caffeine, yes. and I don't judge it at all. Um, I'll drink uh, instant coffee. I'll drink pour overs. I'll drink Starbucks. I'll drink anything. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you mentioned coffee or coffee shops. I was yeah. a coffee shop guy yes. though. Okay. Like, I loved sitting at coffee shops. I, I would read books um, uh, and like journal a lot at coffee shops. And there's one actually right nearby that was close to my heart. They actually just shut shut down, but it was a local joint called the Gypsy Den. And, Gypsy um, Den's gone. I would spend a lot of time. 
Yeah. Oh, oh you're familiar. Huh? Yeah, I am familiar with Costa it. Mesa, yeah. 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 Costa Mesa, I love California. That place. Yeah. yeah. In my college days, I, I spent hours there. Yeah. Do you have you been to Kit Coffee in uh, Costa Mesa? Or is that technically New No, part? it's not ringing a bell. It's uh, off. Oh, where, where is it at? Off 17th. Seventeenth uh, and Irvine, um, over by. Oh no, I I know. Yeah, Keen Coffee. Yeah. There's Keen. Keen is right Keen? by there, but but further oh, down the street, right. there's Kit Coffee. K I T. It's in okay. one of the newer buildings yeah. over there. Also, a really cool coffee shop. Some good food. Um, but yeah, I, nice. I'm I'm fairly familiar with Costa Mesa. I noticed that you guys also have a few locations around the world. Is that just staff members and and that's because because it sounded like you're remote. Yeah. Gotcha. It is mostly, but what we did is uh, we also kind of booked a, a space at every one of those. So we got like a mailing address. We have like a, a, an office space that we could use if we need to. Uh, but yeah, those are key members of our team in those areas. Gotcha, that's great. So w with this distributed team, are you working with companies in those areas or like strategic locations or is it just that the team members happen to be there? Yeah, most, uh, mo mostly because the team members happen to be there. Oh, gotcha. So you're working with companies all over yeah. the world then, or? Yeah, pretty much. Um, but actually, you'd be surprised. We we do get a lot of uh, local business here from Orange County. Yeah, that's great. It's you know it's it's almost contradictory though, or like you know it's it's not as rational because my whole team is is remote. But people still like to know like our headquarters are here or that I'm here. They could always they always kind of joke like they they know where to find me if like anything goes wrong with their their project. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So um, how like have, you've always been remote? It sounded like and d could you imagine a world of not being remote? Like everyone being in person? And are you also doing regular meetups or events to actually be in person? Yeah. So. Um, as far as in like internally, I would I we do have an office space here in Costa Mesa. We've been here for in the same office for like eight years now. Nice. That's my it's that's where I'm at right now, a home away from home. Um, and at at one point we did have a lot of staff working out of here, so I did imagine that there is still something to say about rubbing shoulders and being collaborative, and all being in one space. Um, I don't I don't speak ill like against it. Like I I. I I do like that, and it, it gets a little lonely when you're not interacting with people, um, uh, just you know, around the, like a water cooler. So how do you like? You can't really do that water cooler chat in a remote workplace. But we've we've actually figured out some new ways. There's some new software that like virtualizes office space. Did I get to share that with you in our previous conversation? No. We're using this really cool software called Roam, like. Um, I would I could share my screen, but um, I don't know if that would interrupt everything. No, go for it. Uh, yeah, let's check it out. Um, you know, and I don't have a lot of my staff on right now. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. This is really cool. Uh, I've shared it in the past, and people get a kick out of it. Uh, let's go window. I think I have to do my entire screen. It should be fine. I almost thought you were going to save the metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if it was a metaphor. So it's not anything fancy. Uh, so two of my staff are all, uh, active right now. There's David and Jacob, and they're actually in a conference room together. And if you could see like that little bubble that's kind of uh, showing up around David, uh, that's his him talking. Oh, gotcha. So I know he's talking, and then when he stops, Jacob will start talking. And then if I click on this seat right here, I'll pop in, and I could like um, kind of just join in on their conversation or listen in on their conversation immediately. Um, so uh, if you look down these columns right here, these are everyone's like virtual offices. Um, I'm in my office right now, and uh, you could have like your own bookshelf there and share it with your team. And then um, outsiders could even come visit our virtual office. So, like I could give you an invite, um, and you could come visit and like knock on my door to see if we could come in and say hi. And when you enter in these rooms, um, it's 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 a it's like a, a, a zoom conversation yeah similar to this it's a it's a video conference call and your your webcam opens up and you get to converse um so so as as like a as as a boss it's kind of nice seeing my team active working together collaborating together and i could always pop in and say hi oh gotcha and that's called roam yeah, ROAM. They're a really great company. They um, they're really active. Like we were one of their earliest users. Yeah. So this 
was invented post COVID. Yeah. Like it didn't exist before COVID. And uh, they're just pumping out feature after feature as fast as they can. They invited us um, to their like all hands. They did this big um, uh, conference, I guess. And I didn't go, Dustin went, who was like my head of my operations. And uh, they're really great. I, I could speak to the CEO anytime I want. Yeah. Like they're an amazing company. Oh, nice, that's cool. I'll have to check that out. The, the idea of, of I mean, I'm assuming that you maybe use Slack as well, or is it just just Rome? Yeah. Yeah. So Sl Rome's mostly for your internal video calls, essentially, where where Slack is. And like just seeing people like in their seat in yeah. a way, like Slack, they might have like a little status symbol right. like above everyone's head. Yeah. But like here, like you could, there's like a, almost like a physical nature to it. Gotcha. Um, I mean, look, I grew up in that forum world. I had more friends online at one point than I had in, in like real life. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. You could build great relationships over the internet. And you know, a lot of my staff I've never met in person, yeah. um, but you can, like I, I'm a fond believer you could build relationships, you know, you can find the love of your life through the internet. Um, uh, but actually, to go back and answer your question, I do fly staff in yeah. uh, every once in a while to work out of the office for a week just so that I could bond with them a bit more and get to know them a bit more. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like a perk for some of my staff to like get flown in. Yeah, for sure. Put up here. And, and yeah, I mean, I've worked with a number of people I've never met in person, and it, it just it, it, it works. It's fine. I mean, it, I think maybe it's weird when we were starting to learn how to write software and code. It was probably a time where it's still the other side, or not everyone fully was ready for it. But now, especially after after COVID, everyone's like, I think pretty pretty ready for it. So, uh, Rome, yeah. But I'll have to I'll have to check that out. That that sounds like a cool cool project. Um, I noticed that. So you said you had a bookshelf. What's on that bookshelf? Mm -hmm. I'm curious. Uh, yeah, what did I have on there? Um, one of my favorites um, is the seven um, habits of highly effective people, yep. and that's by Stephen uh, uh, Covey or Covey. Yep, that's a good um, one. And then, uh, I mean, I, I, I read a ton, uh, so this is just a small snapshot. And like um, this one, uh, this one's more philosophical, not a, a business book, but uh, The Man's Search for Meeting yeah. by Viktor Frankl. Yeah. That kind of um, stood out to me. But as far as like business books go, um, and there's some good ones out there. Um, I can't recall all of the ones that, uh, the other one I recommend is uh, Ray Dalio's book. I think it's called Principles. Yeah, Principles, that's right. Yeah, that's a good one by too. Ray Dalio, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, I could keep going. Uh, and fiction, too. I read a ton of fiction. <laughs> What's top of mind? If you could pick two... Yeah, uh, cyberpunk author uh, Neil Stevenson, one of my favorites. Okay. He's the one who actually invented the, the coined the word metaverse. Oh, he, he wrote okay. a book called Snow Crash. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in this world, like this virtual world. Um, really fun book to read. And then he gets, like, really ser he gets into like some real serious topics. Um, another really, my, my favorite book by Steve, uh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. And um, that's, a, it's like a, it's a throwback to when, uh, it's a mixed timelines, but so like it goes back to World War II when um, the English like invented the computer mm -hmm. to like break the Nazi uh, cipher for their messages. Um, so it was that storyline plus some like modern storyline. Um, it's a fun one. That's cool. I could go on. He's read some. Good, one of more his recent ones was like a sci-fi one where it's called Seven Eves, and then within the first chapter, imagine the moon explodes, it shatters, and there's implications of that. If that were to happen, then um, what's going to happen is that the gravitational pull it's going to cause like this immense like meteor a meteorite a meteor storm on Earth and cause the end of humanity yeah. and so they have like a six year like time table like what do you do now and so it's it's the story of how, how humanity uh prolongs its ex existence going into the future and then it, it actually leaps like uh maybe like a million years into the future so it was, it was a mind-bending story it was really cool oh that's that sounds, sounds cool means. that's that sounds like that's gonna be a tv show at some point Maybe, huh? <laughs> yeah, like a series. It, it seems like it. I mean, the moon break, the moon exploding or blowing up—that would be, that would be something else. 
Um, so I noticed that you had another app. I, I wanted to ask you about this before before we went our separate ways. But you had another app called uh, I think it was Better Me, and it was about yeah. waking up in the morning. So what I'm curious yeah. about is, do you wake up in the morning like at a, the same time every day? And is that why you created the app, or is it because you <laughs> wanted to, and th therefore you created this app? So, so tell me that story. I want to hear yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, so I was a procrastinator, or like, yeah, procrastinator. I was not, I wasn't, I didn't have, I always struggled uh, in my morning routines for the longest time, all throughout college, all throughout my early career, because I was such a night owl. Yes. Uh, I loved staying up late and just getting lost in, in, on a computer. Um, but, you know, life changes, life changes quite a bit as you age, and so, um, when I got into like productivity, productivity hacking, mm -hmm. so that's where the idea of this app came about so um, yeah it was this, this alarm clock was supposed to be built in a way, a way where you couldn't like hack it and if you were to try to snooze or disable it or not like get up it would uh, it would it would plaster uh, your like laziness like on your social media so it was like tied into Facebook at the time um, and it would actually just automatically post on your behalf uh, this was uh, back in the days when Facebook API was a little bit more loose. It would let software like post for <laughs> yeah. you that does not exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there was like goal orientation and there was even geolocation built into it for um, class schedules. You could put a GPS pin, put your class schedule. So if, you're, if you weren't in that geofenced area at a certain time, it would like it would it would let the world know that you missed that you were late to class or to work. So it was like it was this idea to like hold people accountable. But one of the biggest shifts I've made personally, though, and that's why I kind of gave up on this project, is you know it doesn't matter. Like in the end of the day, none of these tools matter. It's all like within yourself. You have to get. I don't know how to put it into words, but you just have to get into that state where it's just so important to you like to be on time or to wake up at a certain time that there's no um, no other option. Mm -hmm. like the, uh, and, yeah, and for everyone's a little bit different. And, and currently, I wake up at 6.30 every day, whether it's a weekend or a weekday, whether I've been out super late or not, and that's not all on my own by my own choice though I, I have two kiddos at home now so they're my alarm clock I have no choice to like get up with them they're two under three years old so I have to keep up oh yeah two under three nice yeah I have I have a six yeah. six year old a four year old and almost two year old so I understand the uh, oh, yeah. the the time clock <laughs> feeling my kids like to sleep though thankfully um, oh that's nice but, but getting up at a certain time I think helps a lot because I can get more done you know, I, I mean, that's that's kind of yeah. how I look at it. Um, do do you like before you had kids though? Were you on that same schedule, or were you more of like? Now um, that I was pretty consistent. So yeah, what uh, my my boss he got me into a lot of like the productivity stuff too. Um, he uh, he was really great. So I I've, I've read a ton of like self help books, and he was in un, into uh, Tony Robbins. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, he actually took a small group of us to uh, one of the Tony Robbins um, seminars. It was the Unleash the Power Within. That was a did you fire awesome walk? experience. And, yep, you did. We did. Oh, yeah. good for you. Yeah, yeah nice. that was an amazing experience. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I kind of got into this like, like he would push us a lot. So, you know, cra working crazy work hours. I was working six days a week. Um, it was it was at a time when I was still single yeah. and young and so full of energy, poured all my time into my work. Um, and so that kind of changed me. And then when I uh, left on my entrepreneurial like pursuit, I was, yeah, steady as a rock. Like I was on the, like I would never deviate from my life plan. You know, there wasn't a lot that would pull me away from my work. So I was always at work at a certain amount, at a certain time. Um, I do, you know, 40, 50, like I, w I would sit in an office when like I didn't need to, yeah. you know, a lot of like freelancers this day and age will like talk about like traveling the world yeah. as you work. Yeah. Like I was like kind of the opposite. I'm like, no, like that'd be too much of a distraction. I like, I would sit in like a, a dark, dark office, like with, you know, horrible lighting and, and, and not, and not care. Like I was really obsessed with my work and to this day, like I, um, like throughout COVID after I got married, like I don't have a boss, right? Like I have no one to 
no one to hold me accountable but I've learned since then that like it's just it's it's in, it, innate now like it's within you so I'm pretty cons I'm like I'm really really consistent in my work yeah once you start seeing the results of that consistency yeah. it's like hard to go any other direction you know exactly yeah yeah I like to equate it to like uh, even like exercising like, yeah. you just have to be consistent yeah. uh, that's all there is so you don't have to like you don't have to it's not like a magic puzzle you have to unlock. Like just do the work, yeah. and it gets you'll see results. Yeah. So, do you still follow Tony Robbins, or are you follow anyone else that's like him? Uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, no, you know, I kind of like slow down on the self help stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm kind of I'm good. Like I'm, I'm happy in my own skin. Yeah. Um, I do still see like a therapist, and I do have business coaches. So I love growth, yeah. but not in that self help sense. You know, I'm not looking to like. I'm not looking to find myself as much as before. Sure, sure. Yeah, the reason I ask is the next question is like, have you been doing cold plunges yet or no? <laughs> uh, no, yeah. No. I, I did like one like cold shower, I remember a, long, a while ago. I'm like, this, uh, this is not for me, I'm good. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I that. Cool. How about you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm all about the cold plunges. You're into it? Yeah, yeah. Not, really? the, showers, the showers are fine, but... Um, I much prefer getting into an ice bath because it's either you're going to do it or not, right? A cold shower, you can like turn it warm and it comes on warm immediately, <laughs> yeah. you know, or you stand out of the way. Hmm. But, a, but a cold bath, you get into that, you, you're going straight in. You're either going in or you're not, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's, a, it's a nice daily challenge. Um, but also... The benefits from it are fantastic. I, like, I, there's hardly anything I can. Like, coffee gives you a nice, a nice boost after you have coffee after a long night, a sleepless night with young kids, especially. Coffee is always like, oh yeah, that's great. Uh, but the cold plunge, it's it's like effective very, very quickly, and it lasts much longer than anything else. So I, I highly recommend it to everyone. How do you, yeah. How how do you do it? Like, uh, what's your setup like? Oh, I have, I have a really, really janky setup. It's on my patio. Um, janky in the sense that it was just this $100 like temporary tub bucket thing. Not quite as big as like one of those trash cans you'd have on the street, you know? Uh, like maybe like half the size, but a little bit wider so I can get into it. Um, and then you put ice in or like it's getting cold in Idaho right now. So like it's, I don't need to put ice in anymore. The water's cold enough. Um, and you just you just get in up to up to your neck basically, and you're in there as long as you can stand it, and hopefully that's about three minutes, um, and you get, well, then you get out. But when I was first doing it, man, it was like 20 seconds. You know, I wasn't doing it for very long. Yeah, yeah. But once it's similar to like waking up at the same time, similar to working out. Once you start feeling the benefits from it, it's like oh, that it's it's fantastic. I, I mean, I can't nice. recommend it enough if you've been considering. Uh, but it's not for everyone. I, I totally get that. I, but you mentioned Tony Robbins, yeah. and I'm like, I know that he got super into it from, from friends of mine. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe that would be something else that you'd be into. But, um, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded to it. I'll definitely check it out. But I, I have kind of stopped on, like, the whole, like, mind hacks and, like, self-hack stuff. So, like, I've been kind of on, on a break from it all. But yeah, I'll definitely give it a try, like, once in my life for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. You'll have to tell me uh, what happens after you do. If uh, you got to give it, you got to give it like three or four times, I think. One time, I don't know if it's really enough. I would say even like two weeks worth is like a good good testing ground for is it, it. Every day. Um, the the protocol that Andrew Huberman recommends um, is eleven minutes a week. So shooting for a total of eleven minutes in a week is what you want to do. I do it every day. That's just because I'm like, oh, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it every day until it's a habit, right? And then once it's a habit, then I might still do it every day. So I don't really count exactly how much time I'm doing. But um, to me, it's like if I want to gain a new habit, I got to do it every day. Otherwise, it's like easy to be like, ah, I'm not going to do it today. And then that ends up turning into four or five days or however much longer. And maybe the habit doesn't stick, especially with something like that where, where your visual reaction is like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like every time I stand in front of that bath, I'm like, I don't want to do this, but but I know the aftermath of it. And once I get in, it's like, oh man, I just got to count and just go for it. And everyone I've ever talked to that does it on a regular basis says roughly the same thing. 
Um, and it, but but the benefits from it have been have been phenomenal. So um, I, I can't nice. help but talk about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> cool. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, Abraham is is great chatting. Um, good to get to get to know you a little bit more. Definitely want to do this again. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think the thing about what I'm trying to do with this podcast is I'm trying to get people to start more businesses. Like we look at tr more specifically, build more software and, and and build something that's valuable. I think I think it's I think it's a tricky thing to do. Um, but there's there's it's about making tools that solve for other people and I think you do that all the time that's like your business and you do it with other companies and yeah. stuff like that it's 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 really cool and I you know I, I just yeah. appreciate and we it. barely touched on the subject right yeah I feel like we could spend a lot of time talking about this hours we could I mean there's so much stuff that you can talk about with it um, and so yeah I mean I, I would love to chat with you again um, and I, I'm looking forward to reading your next nonfiction, or excuse me, your fiction novel. I'm assuming that at some point you're going to write one. You have to, because <laughs> you had your you had your blog back in the day. You must be thinking yeah. that there's some story in there that you could come up with. But yeah. Sure. So, anyways, thanks again, Abraham. I really appreciate yeah, you thanks, coming Justin. out. This was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right.